Also, before we begin, we just want to show a quick disclaimer um, that all this information is presented in good faith and should not be used for investment tax or legal advice um, and relied upon for, by recipients for such purposes. And then our feature presenters today are Jeremy Frett, Crop Growers Leader with Crop Growers LLP, John Fitzpatrick, he's a product and training specialist with Crop Growers, and then also Daniel Fisk, he's a claim supervisor for the Atlantic Division for Rain and Hail. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Jeremy, who will be leading today's webinar. Great, thank you, Kyle. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Jeremy Farad. I'm the Senior Vice President and Crop Growers Leader with Farm Credit East. This is my 26 year helping farmers manage weather's unpredictable nature. Thank you all for joining us today. And it certainly means a lot to our team to be able to help you through a difficult time. The 2023 crop year has certainly presented its challenges with above average winter temperatures to a hard freeze that impacted the peach crop to a late spring freeze event on May 18th that impacted a large portion of the Northeast, followed by multiple hail events and most recently um, excess moisture causing issues for some crops in New Jersey. With today's higher input costs and increased weather volatility, it reinforces the importance of developing a sound safety net for your business. Joining us today, we have two crop insurance industry leaders. John Fitzpatrick is the crop insurance product and training specialist for Farm Credit East and crop growers. John has been serving agriculture for over 27 years and has spent the past 16 years helping farmers better manage risk through his role as a crop insurance agent. Dan Fisk is the claim supervisor with Rain and Hail. Dan grew up on a dairy in Western Massachusetts before moving to a larger farm in New York State. And Dan has been serving producers in his claims role for over 12 years. The Northeast fruit industry is critical for many reasons. The economic impact you have is significant with direct sales in excess of over $800 million annually. An overall economic impact to the Northeast of over $3 billion, while supporting over 25,000 on and off farm jobs. The crop insurance program in itself has evolved significantly over the past 10 years for fruit producers. Today, over 1,500 Northeast fruit farmers have depend on the crop insurance program to protect their livelihood. Annually, the crop insurance program provides over $350 million worth of protection, covering just over 100,000 acres of fruit. Over the past 10 years, Northeast fruit producers have received over $300 million in crop insurance claim payments due to weather-related crop losses to offset revenue losses in their business. We're excited about today's topic to help you better understand and better manage uh, the, the situation that we have at hand, and we have the speakers that can certainly help walk you through how a claim is going to be handled. I wanted to take a quick moment and talk with you about the Crop Growers team and who we are um, and what makes up um, our team as a whole as we deliver the federal crop insurance program. Crop Growers has been in place for over 20 years. We protect um, over 700,000 acres. We serve uh, 1,985 farm families. We have 34 dedicated crop insurance agents throughout our eight state area. And the crop insurance program in the Northeast protects 40 individual crops. The team that we have in place are agricultural professionals that go beyond the crop insurance team from a farm credit ease perspective, delivering a suite of financial services from credit to taxes, business consulting, uh, record keeping, appraisal, um, all of the needs that you have from a financial perspective, farm credit ease delivers on. And most recently, this past year, the crop growers team added exclusive technology to help farmers make data-driven decisions. 
We have tools today that take data from 28 different sources and helps agents as we work with producers to develop, to develop those plans to make the best decision possible for your business. Taking a look at the Northeast Fruit Crop Insurance Program, I've identified the crops, uh, the main crops that we insure here. So apples, blueberries, cherries, grapes, cranberries, peaches, and pears. But I also wanted to take a moment to recognize that if you have a crop that's not listed here and you are looking for protection, we do have the Whole Farm Revenue Protection Program and the Micro Farm Policy. So there are options if you're looking at um, your operation and looking at the crop insurance program, there are options that we have that can help align and match up with your business and your business risk. I also wanted to take a moment to look at the current enrollment. So participation in the crop insurance program and its performance over the last 10 years. So with the fruit crops that we've identified, you can see the insured acres. Certainly um, apples um, have the largest number of acres throughout our territory, but grapes certainly very close and blueberries a strong, uh, a strong crop in New Jersey as well as Maine. And then you'll see the policies and to some degree these can translate to the number of farms that we serve but you can get an idea as to the number of producers that are participating in the program. And then you can also see where the program has responded over the last 10 years to help offset the weather-related events, um, whereas, example, the Apple policy has responded to those weather-related events in over $144 million. Now, one note here, as you see, these are the eight states uh, that crop growers and farm credit east serve. This does not include uh, the state of Pennsylvania, which has a significant fruit industry as well. I'm gonna turn it over to John Fitzpatrick now. John's going to discuss the relationship between a crop insurance agent and producer. John, I'll turn it over to you. Hey. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, can you hear me? Sure, sure, sure can. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, John Fitzpatrick, I've uh, been with uh, Farm Credit East for, boy, almost 27 years now. been in uh, crop insurance for the past 16. Uh, prior to that, I was with FSA starting in, uh, um, in the year 1990. So I've been, been around a little, little while here. So. Okay, so I'm going to talk about developing a risk management plan and uh, how agents get involved with producers in, in doing that. So uh, cost of production, that's very important. That's something that we're focusing on a lot more. We want to make sure that you have a risk management plan that at least covers what your cost of production is for the crops that you're growing. Uh, risk tolerance, we're looking at, you know, each producer, what is their risk tolerance? Are they expanding their operation? Do they have a lot of debt? You know, what type of adversity can that business uh, handle uh, before it really starts to get in trouble? Uh, history of losses, what's a common loss for the, the crops that we're working with? Uh, you know, sometimes it's hail, sometimes it's freeze. What kind of history does a producer have for that? And uh, does the crop insurance uh, program that we have, you know, cover those or uh, those types of losses that they have. Uh, so the agent role, um, understanding the industry. As agents, we all come from uh, different backgrounds, and as Jeremy had in one of the slides, there is 40 different crops that we insure in our territory. So the agents need to understand the industries that that they're working with as much as possible. Uh, understanding the producers as well. What types of business do they have? Uh, direct market, commercial, wholesale, and uh, you know what type of uh, plan do we have that can maybe fit that uh, fit that producer? And educating the producers. That's really the most important uh, job that we have as agents is educating the producers on the crop insurance program so that they know how it works and. Um, 
uh, they meet all the requirements and there's a lot of requirements it's a government program um, so that the program works for them so the components uh, what are the components of a risk management plan APH actual production history that is your history of production that you have for your operation for the crop because your coverage is based on APH some crops uh, have five years in their history. Some crops have 10. I think apples and peaches are five and the rest of the perennial crops have a 10 year um, history of average production. Coverage level, uh, how much coverage uh, does a producer need? How much can they afford? What makes sense for their operation? We have coverage levels anywhere from 50%. Uh, I'm gonna go over how that works up to 85% of their APH. Uh, guarantee. Um, so the guarantee per acre is the, the level of production that they would have to fall below, that a producer would have to fall below before the insurance program uh, would start to perform for them. So that's your coverage level times what your APH is. That gives you what your guarantee is per acre. So as an example, if we have an APH of 1,000 bushels per acre, we have a coverage level of 60%. That gives a 600 bushel per acre guarantee. Uh, if the production falls below 600 bushels per acre, then you're looking at a claim situation for that. Okay, so then you've got the established price. It's price per bushel or ton or barrel or whatever perennial crop that you have that the uh, program will pay if there is a claim. Subsidy is the amount of the premium paid by the federal government. Uh, the government does pay a pretty significant part of the premium, anywhere from 67% um, at the lowest coverage level uh, to 55% if a producer chooses the highest coverage level. So that's how much of the premium that the um, government will pay. So in this example here, if the guarantee was 600 bushels per acre and you had a price of $12.00, 40 cents per bushel, and then you had a shortfall of 200 bushels per acre, means that you had a guarantee of six, right? But your production was only 400 bushels per acre. That means you fell below your guarantee by 200 bushels per acre. And that's what the claim would be paid on, is that shortfall, you know, how far below your guarantee you fell. So in this example here, you fell below your guarantee by 200 bushels per acre, multiply that times the price, and in this example here, your claim would be $2,480 per acre. Okay, so how's the plan developed? Um, in this example here, you know, kind of using the previous example that we had, if the producer needs $7,000 per acre to meet what their input costs are, you know, that's what their costs are per acre is $7,000. And if we have a guarantee of 600 bushels per acre, and let's say we have the price of $12.40, then we're gonna multiply the um, guarantee, the 600 bushels per acre times that $12.40, that's gonna give coverage of $7,440 per acre, uh, which means that that exceeds what the, um, you know, at least meets what the input costs are, and that's adequate to cover what they are. Okay, so I'm gonna go over the crop insurance cycle. Um, sales closing, that's October through November. That's when we're meeting with producers and we're looking at their risk management plan to see if any changes are needed. Uh, also to review with them uh, what their different options are. There's new options um, uh, based on the recent farm bills that have come through. Um, that have provided a few more options for producers to um, increase their coverage level and make it work for them a little better. Uh, we want to make sure that the coverage per acre uh, at least equals or exceeds what their input costs are. Uh, we also want to make sure that the correct entity is insured. The correct entity means that who owns the crop, who uh, pays the input costs, uh, who receives the income from the crop, and uh, whose tax return is the sale of the crop on. And that's who needs to be insured. That's 
uh, and what's considered the insurable interest in the crop. So then we have crop reporting, that's from December through January. At that point, we're uh, reporting what the production was for the previous crop year to go into that APH that I talked about before. Uh, we're going to look at new acreage planted. What, you know, what uh, did they put in, any new vines in, any trees, bushes, whatever, um, and, and, and get them accounted for on the crop report. Also looking at any old acreage that was removed that was in the previous history and it's pushed out to uh, you know, account for the new acreage that's coming in, uh, we need to account for that as well. And then we're also going to look at any acreage that meets insurability. Apples, for instance, once they produce 150 bushels per acre, then they're insured the following year. Uh, peaches, uh, once the trees have reached their fourth growing season, then they're insurable that year. Each crop has a different requirement uh, before it's insured. Uh, growing season visits, May through July, that's when we're in touch with producers to you know, see what the crop progress is, uh, see if um, you know, everything's going as planned. Uh, any questions that they may have on the policy itself um, since we had met earlier in the year. Uh, if there's any kind of potential loss, looking at a loss example, or getting an idea of what they think the loss may be, going over the loss example, and I'm going to go over that here in a minute as well, um, so that they um, you know, get re-educated on that. Uh, notices of loss, you know, that's any time, right? Um, especially when we had that May freeze, that was kind of the beginning of when we started seeing some crop damage. Uh, if agents are aware of any weather events, then we want to contact producers to, you know, see what uh, if they also experience that same the same issue with that. Um, and then sometimes we contact producers, or sometimes they contact us. Um, submitting notices of loss, uh, we as agents, once we talk to producers and find out what kind of loss they have we need to submit a notice, what's called a notice of loss, to the insurance company. That gets the insurance company in touch with the producer. And they will work uh, with the producer uh, to finalize the claim. Okay, so this is a, a loss example. We go over this when we meet with producers at sales closing. Uh, it's a fairly, um, you know, we're trying to take and put Everything in layman's terms, try to put it in a format that producers can understand. And so far, this has worked very well. So the first thing we look at is the APH. And in this case here, that's the average production history for five or 10 years, depending on the crop that you have. So in this example here, we're saying it's 1,000 bushels per acre. Uh, this producer chose 60% coverage level. So if you take 60% of 1,000, that's 600 bushels per acre, which is your guarantee. And if you fall below that, then you're in a claim situation. So let's say in 2023, your production at harvest was 800 bushels per acre. So from a production standpoint, this is an apple. This is a, uh, an example for an apple policy here. Um, so from a production standpoint, you had 800 bushels per acre. It's lower than your APH, but it, it's above your guarantee. So if the fruit is good and there's no damage, um, you wouldn't have a claim in this scenario. But Let's say that you had a hailstorm, right? And 50% of your fruit didn't grade you as fancy. Um, based on a sliding scale, that's considered a 70% loss. So that means that 70% of the 800 bushels that you have are considered damaged and they won't count as production. So in this example here, it's 560 bushels that won't count as production. So we take your 800 bushels that you had, we're going to subtract the uh, damaged bushels of 560, that's going to leave you with production to count at 240 bushels. Okay, so you had 800, so many of them were damaged that you only ended up with 240 that's going to count in a claim situation. So we look at your guarantee, we say, okay, your guarantee was 600, we're going to subtract the 240 that you had, that's going to leave you with 360 bushels below your guarantee per acre that you fell. And that's what a claim is paid on, how far below your guarantee you fell. So we take the 360 bushels, multiply it times the price. And in this case here, we're using $12.40. And 
and your indemnity per acre in this example would be $4,464. Uh, multiplied times however many acres you have in the unit, uh, maybe it's your entire operation, maybe you have different farms, um, but it, uh, everything goes on a unit basis is what it goes on. Great, thank so, you, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, that's the end of my presentation. Okay, okay. Um, we're going to turn it over to Dan Fisk to talk about um, ensuring the best claim experience. All right, thank you, Jeremy. So I'm going to do my best to give you kind of a broad overview of a claim experience. Uh, there's a lot of variations and a lot of uh, kind of one-off sort of experiences. So I'm going to give you just a general sense of, of what the claim experience is, what we do on our side as claims adjusters uh, to kind of let you know uh, what to expect should a claim arise. Uh, now we're actually hoping one does not. It is not our goal for you to experience any kind of bad weather or any problems. We love when it's perfect weather and we don't have to visit. Uh, but if something happens, then we're there to, to help you through this. So um, you'll see the first thing is you got to notify your agent immediately. So you, in most instances, you have 72 hours, three days uh, to call your agent. So if there was a freeze last night, call your agent today. Hailstorm blows through this afternoon. Please call right away and notify them so that they can submit a claim. That's really what gets the ball uh, rolling as far as our side goes. So as soon as you let them know, it'll come into our system, we will contact you immediately. The other thing is you might not have a loss, but you'll see the second thing on the list there is the direct market appraisal. So a direct marketer, uh, many of you probably already know that's somebody who sells directly to the public. It might be, uh, since we're talking about apples, Maybe you're a you pick operation. The, the public comes in, picks all the apples. So we would come in, we would do appraisals before you start picking to help verify production. The other couple of things when you're submitting your notice of loss, information that helps us help you is great. So best way to contact, that's changed over the years that I've been doing this. You know, we, we don't have landlines as much anymore. We're dealing more with cell phones. So maybe the best way to contact you is with a text. So let us know that, you know, if you're in the tractor, you, you maybe can't hear your phone, but you can see something come through. So let us know best way, text, email, phone call, whatever it is you prefer. And then also the best time. If you know first thing in the morning is when you're in the office, you like to get business done, that's great. Or if you like to get out, you know, into your orchard or vineyard early and you'd rather have us contact you later in the day, uh, you know, anything that helps us get a hold of you, uh, because we know you're busy. We don't want to pester you with a lot of different uh, questions and, and seven different voicemails trying to get a hold of you. So, you know, anything that's just convenient for you, let your agent know, hey, this is the best time and this is the best number or, or this is the best email to get a hold of me. And then also any pertinent notes, that helps us. So when you submit your claim, let us know it was a hailstorm or you had a freeze and, and potentially maybe it wasn't um, a hard freeze, but you have a concern. So always put your claim in. This is not like other types of insurance where there's a penalty. So um, from, I should say there's no penalty for multiple claims. If you have bad weather three years in a row, there's no penalty for that, that we know it happens. We have weather data that certainly shows it. So, um, but again, uh, put the notice in as, as soon as you notice uh, you have any type of weather issue, or if it's just starting to dry up and you're like, wow, we haven't had rain in weeks and, and my crop is starting to show some signs of stress, then, then also please include that in there as well. And Jeremy, if you're clicking, thank you. So your responsibility, you'll see number one, as a producer, you're gonna submit that notice of loss, that, that starts it. But the second thing, we're kinda gonna go clockwise around this, uh, these four. We want you to maintain your crop throughout the growing season. 
So even if it's looking kind of poor, it is still your responsibility to take care of it as best you can, you know, to keep spraying it, to keep doing, uh, you know, regular maintenance of that crop throughout the entire growing season. You, you can't just give up. You have to do the best you can with it, even if it's looking pretty ugly, uh, still give it your best shot on, on producing a crop. You know, in, in weird or odd instances, heavy damage, you'll see underneath that I put consent or representative samples. There are times where we can come out and say, yep, yeah, it looks pretty terrible, but we want you to leave, you know, a certain number of trees, just maintain those few trees. So that way we can watch those throughout the growing season. Uh, you wouldn't have to maintain the entire block or the, the whole orchard, but we could maybe pick out a spot where it's like, just maintain this one spot. Um, but that will work with you on a one by one or a one on one basis so that we see, um, you know, if we can do something like that to help you out. Then the, the stay in contact with the adjuster throughout the process, we really want you uh, to be available. And we're not going to call you every day by any means, but we do want to stay in touch with you to see how the crop is progressing. Because sometimes, you know, you're like, well, we had a freeze, I'm not sure. And sometimes you'd be like, you know what, I don't have any issues. My crop looks great. No worries. Let's go ahead and release that claim. We're not going to work it. Um, or it may be getting worse. Hey, can you come out and take a look? That hail damage was a lot worse than I thought. Uh, I really don't have much of a crop. Um, and then the last one is maintain records. Um, I would love to tell you that it's it's simple and not a big deal, but we really do need good and accurate records. And I really want to stress that most of you are probably familiar with having to maintain a lot of this stuff. You know, the harvest records, your sales receipts and sales records, spray records, you know, and there may be even other stuff that you have to maintain. So please keep it as detailed as possible. Um, I know everybody gets busy and sometimes it's hard to write everything down, but that will really help you the most in your claim situation. The more accurate, the more detailed, uh, the better they'll be. And, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about records. So you see harvest records, those are really important. Um, you know, you probably maintain pick records uh, you know, a record of how much each person picks and that kind of stuff. But load records are something we're really looking for on our side. You know, how many truckloads and how many bins are on each truckload. Keep track of all of that stuff um, as it leaves either the orchard or as it gets booked in. Um, we would, we kind of need that. So, so load records, kind of back of your mind, keep that uh, term. Uh, that's going to help us uh, finalize your claim. Also, sales records. So if you're selling all of your stuff to a packer or something like that, um, you know, we need records that have like the name of your name on there. You're the insured, the name of the buyer who bought it, uh, quantity. And now if you're in apples, I put the F and the P there for fresh and processing. So we need to know how much of each, you know, how did they grade out? That helps us with the quality determination. The date of the sale, uh, the price is important as well. How much did they sell for? Because uh, that also helps us determine some of the, the, throughout the process, and I won't get super deep into it, but, but price per bushel, per pound, um, all that is, is something we look for. Variety. If you can include the variety names, um, apples especially can be insured by variety or variety grouping. So we need to know, were they honey crisp? Were they galas, uh, Macintosh, what were they? And then also if you can include the location. So as you sold it, where did it come from on your farm? Because you may have your policy, your insurance policy broken out by what we call units. So you may have a unit of honey crisp. And then maybe you have a, a unit of uh, a couple other varieties mixed together. So if we can keep it separate by those locations, that's gonna help us uh, allocate your production accordingly at claim time. And then a big term you're gonna hear a lot in, in crop insurance is contemporaneous records, which really is a, a daily record. So especially if you're a, like a UPIC operation, uh, you know, how many, apples did you sell that day? And 
what we would need is a record of of not just I sold um, a thousand dollars worth of apples, but but track it by I sold you know this many half bushel bags and these and peck bags and half pecks and whatever the the um, quantity was of each thing uh, would really help us. So kind of a log, just tick marks of each thing that you sell. If you could keep it by the register, uh, again that's another detailed um record that would help us and then price in in those records how much are you selling them for because again that'll help us determine uh fresh versus processing so you know if you're getting twenty dollars a bushel or four dollars a bushel uh you know please track all of that as well and then working with your adjuster um, you know, we, we've got the records, you, you're keeping those, uh, we appreciate it, and I know again, I'm going to tell you again, it takes time, but we, we really do need those. But what happens is you submit your claim, the adjuster is going to contact you, and on the first phone call, uh, hopefully we've got notes from the agent that they got from you on what the situation is so that we don't have to say it over again. But we want to know kind of the extent of damage. When we first call you right after you submit the claim, how bad is it? Well, hail pretty much wiped us out. We've probably got 80% damage. Or uh, we've got drought and, you know, we're, we're looking at a little stress. So we're, we think we're down about 20% of our crop. So just a rough idea of, of how bad it is. That helps us kind of judge how the area is going to turn out and gives us some information to, to better serve not just you, but the entire area. And then the other um, the other thing is the time frames. When we do that first phone call, um, you know, let us know what you're looking at. Well, you know, harvest is going to start first week of September, or that'll help us plan how we stay in touch with you. Because you know, we don't want to bug you with a lot of phone calls, um, but we also don't want to miss something where you've already started harvesting and we should have been out there looking at the crop beforehand. So make sure we're we're staying. Um, you know, within your time frames of harvest uh, so that we can stay in front of, of you and not bother you while you're in the midst of actually getting your crop in. And then the other, like I already said, you know, when we first contact you, double check, best way to stay in touch, or if perhaps there's someone else we should be talking to. Sometimes we'll get a contact and you're like, you know what, my spouse handles that side, why don't you talk to them? Or we've got a farm manager, stay in touch with them throughout the season, and, and then I'll work with you at claim time. So um, let us know, maybe there's somebody else that, that we should be uh, staying in touch with as well. And then maintain contact throughout the claim process. So, you know, as we're going through the claim, if we're out, um, you know, we're doing appraisals, make sure we're, we're having discussions about how they're going. You know, this is what we're finding out in your vineyard. Does that sound about right? You know your vineyard better than we do. So, you know, we like to stay in touch because if we're finding a lot more fruit than you think, well, maybe we're not in the right area or, or maybe it was better than you thought. So, you know, stay in touch with us. Keep us, uh, you know, up to speed on what you're seeing and, and we'll also share the same information with you. Also, update us. If there's any further damage so this year we have a lot of it we had that freeze the late freeze a lot of damage and then a whole bunch of hailstorms blew through uh, so we had additional damage that helps us on the adjusting side to know okay you know we were looking at about a half a loss and now we have even half of what's left got hurt so now there's only about 25 percent of a crop and then that last one was verifying appraisals is you know make sure that you and the adjuster are agreeing because we're going out we're we're looking at your orchard we're taking kind of some test samples and and we want to make sure we're as accurate as can be so if if we haven't gotten into the right part of the orchard and and you think we're finding too many bushels we're finding 800 bushels to the acre in the high density and you thought it was more like 600 well come on out with us let's let's double check it make sure we all agree so that we're doing it on the front side because if we wait till we're finalizing the claim in, in February or March or, uh, you know, who knows what time frame that might be, we can't go out and double check the crop. So, you know, we can't compare anything at that point. We just have our numbers, 
So that's why we really wanna be very careful that we're agreeing so that we don't come up with a, a number that is uh, not accurate. And then um, finalizing the claim. So as we finish up uh, the claim, if you have multiple units, as I was saying, if you've got several different areas that have been separated out uh, within your orchard or vineyard, we can settle units one at a time. Uh, now we probably won't settle one every single day. You know, we might do, uh, we might wait a week so that we could settle a couple at once, but we can schedule time. So once you've sold your production off of one unit, we'll come out, we will close that unit uh, you can get paid for that one, and then we can uh, settle the others as you sell the rest of your crop. Uh, the other is you provide records at finalizing the claim. That's where we're going to collect all the docs that you've been saving, you know, your load records, your sales receipts. Uh, depending on what type of claim it is, that's when we are going to use your records um, to verify everything and help to settle your claim. The other thing I, I added in here was notify your adjuster if you're going to have an extended vacation. And this happens a lot, um, especially in some of our perennials, the, the apples, the vineyards, you get all done, you've worked hard, you've sweat throughout the whole year, you finally got everything into storage. And the next thing we know, one of our insureds has gone to Spain for a month and we can't close the claim. So, uh, you know, great for you if you can take a, a vacation or head to Florida for a couple of weeks. But if you could just let us know that you'll be gone, uh, then we won't try to schedule finalizing your claim during that time. But we do want to make sure that we have everything we need um, before you take off. So by all means, enjoy your vacation. Have a great time. We'll all be jealous of it. I will say that. Wish we were going with you. Uh, but if you've got something long and you know it's going to be difficult, uh, let us know so that that way we can either try to get it in ahead of time or just be patient because like I said, I don't want to leave you six voicemails wondering where you are if you're out of the country. Uh, and then a couple other things, uh, the tools that we have available, um, ACH, which is direct deposit. When we finalize a claim at Rain and Hail, we can sign you up for direct deposit. Um, we can do it right while we, you're in the office. It only takes a few minutes. And that way, when your check is cut, it is immediately deposited in your account. Now, right now, we're averaging uh, about two to three days from the time we finalize the claim until the check is cut. So at least for our company, if you have direct deposit, that means in two or three days, most likely that's sitting in your checking account. And that's what we want. We want you to have your money as fast as possible. Uh, the mail, we've had issues, uh, especially at COVID time. We had trouble with checks. We, we had one um, check never showed up. So the farmer asked if we could uh, go ahead and void that check and send a new one. So we did. We overnighted it. And overnight took seven days. Uh, you know, everything was slow. They're, they're overworked. There's um, you know, trying to get all their packages delivered. So guess what happened during the seven days while the overnight was coming, the original check showed up. So it just saves a lot if we can just sign you up. You can also sign up with your agent. Uh, so whenever you're doing your reporting, anything along those lines, they can sign you up as well. Uh, but we just like you to get your money faster. We've even had, uh, we've had a bunch over the years where the claim came in in the morning, we called the farmer, everything was ready to go. We visited the farmer, we submitted our claim paperwork in the afternoon and the check was actually in the account the same exact day that the claim um, was put into the system. So it doesn't happen a lot, but that's how fast we wanna get you paid uh, if we can. And, and certainly direct deposit is one of the ways we can do that. The other thing we have available is policyholder services. You can sign up for your own rain and hail account and on there, you can look at your policy, you can pay your bill, you can even report production. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can do on there. So we encourage you to uh, get one of those as well. Uh, that also helps us communicate with you. There's a lot of good stuff on there, but really it helps you um, you're basically monitor your own business and, and you can see what you've got 
and, and it's just a helpful tool that you can use. Just a website you can go to, simple login, and monitor all your own business. So I know that was a fairly quick overview um, of a lot of stuff with a claim, uh, but we are here to help in the, the instance where you do have a problem. Like I said, we hope you don't. We want just beautiful weather and timely rains, but uh, you know when problems hit, we want to make sure we get you taken care of. Great, thank you, Dan. Great overview of the claim process, the importance of that communication between the producer and the adjuster, and what to expect throughout the claim um, experience as a whole. So great, great points. Um, we are ready for moving our discussion over to question and answers. Um, and we do have a few questions that have come in. So let me go to our, our chat here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm, pardon me, I'm going to uh, read the question and then direct it to the right team member that we have here. So uh, first question is, how do you ensure startup operations? Thank you for that question from our from our audience. And John, um, if I can ask you to respond to that question, I think that's uh, right in line with um, with your knowledge base. Yeah. So for startup operations, um, we do have what's called a beginning farmer rancher program, which um, um, gives you additional subsidy and um, uh, gives you a couple of other benefits as well. So uh, you know, for beginning farmers, you haven't farmed at all, maybe you've farmed one or two years, um, you know, we do have a program for that. Um, and sometimes maybe a beginning farmer is taking over the operation of someone else, um, then their production history, they may be able to use the production history from uh, that other producer uh, to help give them a, a good start. So uh, anybody interested in that, Jeremy's gonna give out, um, you know, numbers uh, for, uh, you know who to contact, but um, you know contact uh, Farm Credit, find out uh, who the agent is in your territory, and uh, we can work with you on you know a startup operation, a policy for a startup operation. Great, thank you, John. A uh, couple more questions uh, came through. How do I get coverage for apples if apple coverage is not available in my county? John, I'm going to stay with you on that one. Uh, yeah, there's a, there a couple things that you can do. Uh, Farm Service Agency has what's called a NAP program, non-insured assistance program. So if we can't cover it under a multi-parallel policy, then Farm Service Agency uh, would have a program for that under their NAP program. So you would definitely want to contact them. Um, another possibility is what's called a written agreement, where even if the crop is not insured in that county, uh, we may be able to apply for an exception to that. We need good records. It has to be at least three years of good records. That wouldn't work with a beginning farmer uh, because they have to have at least three years. Um, maps of the operation, things like that. Um, and so we could work with a written agreement. We got to submit that in. It's a case by case basis and may be able to get a policy for that. Uh, the other option would be a whole farm policy, which covers all crops. So if you grow four or five different crops and maybe two or three are insurable and the other three are not, uh, we could do a whole farm policy, which kind of is a blanket coverage for all of the crops in your operation. Great, great points, John. Um, you, you had referenced in one of the slides, John, about the sales period and the time that agents are talking with producers. Uh, the question that came through is, when's the last day to sign up for coverage? So November 20th, so in our area, there's throughout the country, there's different dates uh, depending on the region that you're in, but really in the Northeast, November 20th is the deadline to sign up for coverage for all of our um, uh, perennial crops, uh, cranberries, blueberries, peaches, grapes, apples, pears. Uh, that's the, um, I know I'm missing one, but, but that is the deadline for all of the perennial crops in our area. Great, thank you, John. Uh, this one looks like it's gonna be for Dan uh, in your loss example on, or in, as you were reviewing apples, um, 
and then records, it says, uh, what can you do with your apples after the claim has been settled? So claim question, as you go to finalize the claim, what can you do with your apples after the claim has been settled? Sure, uh, it's a good question. We actually don't settle claims until after the final disposition. So we wait until the apples are sold so that we know how they were sold. Uh, but I just wanna make sure that everybody knows it is your crop to do with as you wish. Uh, what we always say is we want you to make the best decisions with your crop based on your situation. So, you know, we'll understand that, that like I, I think I mentioned, sometimes, um, you know, that you might not pack out the way you want them to. Uh, your apples don't look as good as you want. So you might have to sell them a little bit differently than you would like. So you have to make that decision. Uh, but again, we will always wait till they are sold uh, and production is gone. Uh, but again, you, you get to decide what you do with that crop. It is your choice. Great, thank you, Dan. Uh, last question, uh, let's see. Oh, pardon me, I have another question. Is there a revenue protection option for apples, not just production-based? John, you wanna take that one? Uh, yeah, there, there is not a revenue-based uh, policy for apples right now. We do have that for corn, soybeans, other row crops, things like that. Uh, the only option you would have uh, for revenue protection for apples would be that whole farm policy because that covers not not only a production loss but a a revenue loss that could be from a general economic uh, trend in the area or anything like that as long as it's not a man-made uh, you know issue um, that's that's causing that reduction of income but a whole farm policy would be uh, the way to protect the revenue for that crop Thank you, John. Uh, we have another question. Not sure if we can, um, we're, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna try to do my best to answer this one. How much in claims have been paid out thus far this year across the Northeast due to freezes, hail and other events? Um, and how does this compare to past years? Great question, thank you. Uh, we have, most of our, pay, uh, pardon me, most of our peaches have been closed. If there were no peaches, those claims uh, have been finalized and paid. I can get that information. Um, it just isn't off the top of my head right now. Uh, I And how does it compare to past years? Uh, you know, we've, we've been, with over 20 plus years of serving production agriculture, uh, I've, I've watched many, many years uh, where there's been significant events. Um, we can look at uh, past freeze year events. It's, I'm gonna say it's still a little too early to tell um, what we're gonna see for claim uh, payments. I would say number of claims and how widespread the events have been. This is a this is a, above average. This is above average. I anticipate that we're going to see claim payments above average. Uh, we're still trying to assess what the apple crop is going to be. Uh, the New Jersey excess rain caught us at a point in which the blueberry crop was about halfway uh, of completed with harvest. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, so I would say number of claims were above average. Indemnity payments, I would forecast that we're gonna be above average. There's also one other component that really has has been a, a significant improvement to fruit producers uh, risk management plans and that came into play about four or five years ago and that's something known as the supplemental coverage option if you're a fruit producer and you um, you're really concerned about uh, protecting a greater percentage of the fruit. And I, this is an area-based plan, but that supplemental coverage option 
whether it's county or multiple counties, can protect as much as 86% of the expected area yield. And just this past year, we paid out a little over $3 million to perennial producers uh, that their area yield fell below 86%. So if you haven't had the conversation uh, with your agent, I know it's on our fact sheet. So I know if you're visiting with one of our team members, we are reviewing that, but I would say, look at that much closer. Uh, those, we don't know when those, um, we don't know until May 1st, the following year, if our yields fell below that trigger point. But I would say uh, a takeaway for our, our group attending here today would be to explore that supplemental coverage option. I believe that there's a lot of value in that program and we've seen it um, respond to area losses pretty significantly. Um, so good questions. Um, and we, we typically uh, will have the claim data towards the end of the year. And because apples, it takes a while to have for final disposition, uh, it takes until the following year to know where we truly are in the claim payments. It does take a while to assess what those claim payments are. I've got Jeremy, John, I just got on the RMA website for the 2023 peaches anyway in the Northeast. Thank you. Um, so at least preliminary data, we've got about 1.8 million paid in peach claims this year. About a million one is in Massachusetts alone. Um, and then New Jersey, I think um, they're about, is that New Jersey? 464, New Hampshire, about 464,000 uh, in peaches. So uh, throughout the Northeast, about 1.8 million at this point. Thank you, John. I, d I gave you some time to, to look that up, huh? You did, absolutely. <laughs> All right. We do have another question. Um, John, I'm going to turn this one over to you. It's if you are a new farm without any APH, do you use the county average? Uh, if you are, it depends on the crop. So there are crops that have a production minimum requirement, and apples is one of those. So if you're starting an apple operation, uh, number one, your trees have to meet at least 150 bushels per acre uh, before they can be insured. Um, so um, you can't get an apple policy in, and insure your apples unless you have a history of production. Whether you have it yourself and they met 150 bushels per acre, um, or you're able to use the production history from another producer. But um, without Without any APH, you can't do that with apples. With uh, peaches and other other uh, crops, you can. So it really does depend on the crop itself. Great, thank you, John. It looks like that. I'm just going to take another quick look here, make sure we've um, responded to everybody's questions. It looks like we have. Uh, really appreciate the questions. Uh, just a some few closing comments, and I really appreciate Dan referencing the direct deposit. Our goal once the claim is closed is to get those funds into your hands as soon as possible. Um, we don't want to wait for the mail. We, we know you're, you need those funds. So that's one takeaway is sign up for direct deposit. The next one is how important it is to communicate with your team and your team, uh, your lender, if you work with uh, farm credit, you work with uh, any lender, communicating with them is critical during this time. Uh, there's, there's information that they, um, that they can help you with, that they can help work with you with, if they understand that you've got a loss of revenue, uh, you want to be having that conversation with your loan officer so that you can come up with a plan and a strategy so that it doesn't have an even more significant impact on your business. Also, talk, of, talk with your tax preparer. Uh, the timing of those claim payments and when you would typically receive the revenue from the crop, there's language within the Ag Tax Code that can allow you to defer that revenue so that it doesn't have a, a secondary hit on your tax liability. So talking with the team around you uh, that you work with is really critical. 
uh, so that you can get the best information and make the best business decisions as you move throughout the year. Also, especially for perennial producers, we typically don't have um, a, 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 an ongoing communication relationship with the Farm Service Agency, but it is very important to be working with them, talking with them, letting them know uh, that you experienced a crop loss. And the reason being is, especially over the last several years, we've seen more disaster assistance programs. And typically, if you're in a weather-related event, uh, there's probably other producers that are experiencing the same situation. And you communicating your situation with the Farm Service Agency, they communicate it up. And if there is a disaster assistance program, then you have that open line of communication. And if, um, if there's a sign-up period, you don't miss that. So communicating with the Farm Service Agency is another important step. And then thinking about the following year, John covered it exceptionally well, talking about uh, the relationship between an agent um, and, and how important that is for your annual risk management planning. If this year you've experienced a financial hit, that may expose your business to uh, vulnerabilities the next year. And we may need to increase your coverage to reduce your risk. That's a normal process that we go through. Uh, we, this is what we do, uh, and this is what we're intimate with in understanding risk, helping you manage that risk, helping you plan um, so that we can recover from this type of a loss. So a few closing comments here. Um, and really wanted to thank everyone for attending. You'll, and John referenced this, um, how to get a hold of your local crop insurance agent. You've got our 800 number here. You have our, your local Farm Credit East office. Uh, your representative with Farm Credit East can get you in contact with who the local crop growers agent is. And then we also have our crop growers website that has a listing of all of our team members. So. I thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back over to Kyle to wrap us up here. Great. So again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, just as a uh, note for everybody, all of our webinars past, present, and future live at farmcredit.com forward slash webinars, as well as our YouTube channel. So you can just search Farm Credit East and we will pop right up. Um, and you'll also, for attending day, we'll get a reminder email uh, to view that recording if you um, chose to do so. With that, we will close it out here and hope everybody has a great afternoon and try to stay cool out there. Thanks.